Starting now. Okay. Um, so tonight we're excited to host Shashank Agarwal and Kaylee McCormack, who will be talking about the Flint water crisis. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Shashank and Kaylee during a science and environmental policy class last semester, where they started a vast research project on the topic of lead, lead in Flint. Um, I'd like to thank them again for taking the time to share their insights with us. A few more details about our speakers. So Shashank is a fifth year PhD student in uh, the mechanical engineering department at MIT. He works on developing real-time modeling methods for vehicle locomotion on granular materials. He's an active member of the MIT graduate community and has recently received the Horton Edwards Fellowship Award for his long-term contribution to the community. Beyond his research, he's interested in understanding the role of public policy in the adoption of scientific knowledge by society. He's been working with Professor Susan Solomon and Kaylee on the topic of the Flint water crisis for the past year, with a specific interest in the policy shortcomings that led to the crisis. In the coming days, he'll also be speaking at the EPA's public listening se session on the lead and copper rule. Um, Kaylee is a third year PhD student in chemical engineering at MIT. She works on the nanoscale confinement as applied to electrocatalysis. Beyond the lab, she's a student advocate working in the RISE campaign, uh, Reject Injustice Through Student Empowerment, and SAS, Student Advocates for Survivors. She's also a new fellow in the communication lab at MIT. After taking Susan Solomon's class in 2020, she realized that what happened in Flint was a clear case of social injustice and negligence. And in addition to policy failure, she also became interested in diving deeper into these uh, issues. So we'll have a, a presentation by our speakers and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, Shashank and Kaylee, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ubalti. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hello all, I'm Shashank, as Kelly, um, as Ubalti already uh, introduced me. So we're going to talk about the Flint water crisis. Uh, our pre presentation is pretty long today, so without giving much more introduction, <laughs> we'll directly jump into the presentation. Uh, so the overall aim of this particular presentation is to give you a holistic understanding of Flint water crisis, especially by shedding lights on various scientific, sociological, historical, administrative, and the policy issues which led to this crisis. And we are interested in all these points because often uh, you hear about Flint crisis, but people just talk about, let's say, the policy shortcomings which led to this crisis, the administrative shortcomings which led to this crisis. But if you want to really understand what actually happened in this case and how things unfolded, it's very important that you understand all these aspects. So that's the overall aim of our presentation is today. And this is going to be the overall overview of our presentation that we'll start with uh, telling you the consequences of lead poisoning to the human body. We'll go into the chemistry of lead poisoning in water. How does lead comes into the water? The, especially in the drinking water. Then we'll go into a brief timeline of Flint crisis, how things unfolded uh, when the crisis started. Then we'll go into the historical, sociological, administrative, and the policy aspects related to Flint crisis and how each one of them was extremely important in uh, which led to this crisis. If any one of them has been in the favor of the people, this crisis would not have happened. And uh, towards the end, we'll go into the aftermath of this crisis, that how things have changed in Flint as well as in the country as a result of this particular crisis. So directly jumping into the effects of lead. So lead is also called silent epidemic. And there's a reason for that. So at fundamental level, uh, lead is a heavy metal cation, which when absorbed in the body, it starts replacing uh, relatively lighter cat uh, cations in the body, for example, calcium, iron, and many others. And as you know that all of these uh, ions have very important role in the body. For example, calcium is present in our bones or iron is present uh, in uh, hemoglobin, which is responsible for carrying oxygen in the body. So if lead starts replacing these ions in the body, uh, the overall uh, capability of the body to maintain itself goes down. Uh, for example, if you focus your attention, okay, I'll use the pointer here. So if you focus your attention on the right hand side, you can see around 10 ppb, you see effects like decreasing IQ level, decreasing hair and growth. Similarly, at 20 ppb, you start seeing effects on the nervous system. And around 150 ppb, lead poisoning causes death. And the most unfortunate part about lead poisoning is there are no immediate signs of lead poisoning in the human body. You see effects like, uh, but 
once it starts showing effects, the effects are IQ drop, memory loss, mood disorder, aggressive behaviors, and all of these symptoms are really difficult to diagnose. How do you know that I'm dumb because I have blood poisoning or it's just my nature or whether it's because my age I'm showing an aggressive behavior. And that's very unfortunate. And in the advanced stage, there are uh, relatively easier things to diagnose, for example, kidney, lung, and neurological damage. But by that time, the body has already suffered the uh, effects of lead poisoning. But the effects are not limited just to the individual. At a socioeconomic level, there are implications. For example, if you think about this study, which was done in 1988 by Waze, it shows that how the IQ of a society changes as a result of lead poisoning. It shows that the overall IQ of the society decreases as the lead poisoning occurs in the society. And along with that, the total number of gifted people in that society, which means the innovators, the leaders, which really push society forward, decreased by more than 50%. And similarly, the number of mentally challenged people which need support from the society, which needs more resources by the society to support them also decreases. I'm sorry, also increases by more than 50%. So this overall lead poisoning drags the society backward. And that's the reason this is called a silent epidemic. And the other thing is like the lead poisoning is not uh, bad for, um, so it is bad for adults, but it is even worse for infants, especially in the age uh, group of 12 months to 24 months, because if lead poisoning occurs in the early stage of life, the brain development does not happen properly. So these are the bad effects of lead, but let's go into uh, understanding how important lead poisoning is, lead poisoning through water is when it comes to ingested lead in adults. So as per EPA, 20% of ingested lead in adults and 40 to 60% of ingested lead in infants comes from drinking water. And there are multiple sources for that. One is the lead service lines, which is the line, uh, the pipe connection between the main supply and the water supply of homes. Similarly, the lead pipes, fittings, fixture, all the, uh, the uh, all the plumbings in the housing water systems consist a lot of uh, amount of lead. There are laws for controlling this uh, poisoning. There is the uh, Drinking Water Act 1986, and there is lead and copper rule of 1991. But clearly, those laws are not very effective, and that's the reason we are having this decision. And uh, as per the estimates by NRDC, uh, the millions of lead lines, which is usually of order of three to nine millions, are still in use um, in US in the US houses. Uh, so that's that's the level of issue we are talking about. So first, we'll give a brief summary of Flint water crisis here. We're a very uh, high level uh, summary. So this issue started in 2014 when the city of Flint decided to switch its water supply from the blue pipeline that you see here, it's DWSD pipeline, to a new pipeline, which is shown in red here, which is KWA pipeline, because this was cheaper. But the pipeline, the red pipeline was not uh, complete by the, uh, in 2014. So they decided to wait for it for one and a half year. And in the meantime, they started taking water from the local river, which is Flint River, which you see here. Now, while doing this change, they did not follow proper corrosion control treatment, and which resulted in increased level of lead in the adults as well as ch children. Specifically in children, the total number of children under uh, elevated lead levels increased from 1.5% to 8.5% within just a year. So you can understand how bad the issue was. The issue, uh, the story broke out with the effect, uh, with the efforts of citizen scientists uh, in March 2015, and the steps were taken. So before moving further, uh, we first try to understand how does lead comes into the water itself from the lead service lines. So clearly, we thought that. Thanks, Shashank. Um, so I wanted to give a bit of a primer on corrosion and how the lead actually enters the water. So corrosion involves the oxidation of a metal by an oxidant, resulting in the release of metal ions and soluble metal compounds into the water from pipe scale. Um, the concentration of the metals in the water, namely lead in this case, uh, is controlled by the stability and solubility of the existing pipe scale under the operating conditions that are used in the water system. There can also be metal oxide scale that leaches into the water in the presence of reductants. Um, and here you can see a log activity pH diagram for lead that predicts the formation of lead orthophosphate solids even at low pH. And this will become important in a moment. Uh, so lead, uh, lead, uh, lead scale is uh, composed of lead oxides, lead carbonates, lead hydroxycarbonates, lead phosphates, and hydroxyphosphates. And of these, lead oxides and lead phosphate solids are the least soluble. Um, lead carbonate and hydroxycarbonates can have their solubility minimized by controlling the pH and alkalinity of the water, 
However, changes to distribution and water system chemistry can destabilize all of these corrosion pro products and premise plumbing. Um, the chemistry of pipe corrosion is made much more complicated by the presence of iron, metal ions, including calcium and magnesium, carbonate, bacteria, chloride ions, hypochloride ions, organic member, matter, and dissolved carbon. Um, lead oxide can only be formed in the presence of free chlorine. Um, so when free chlorine is depleted, uh, lead oxide dissolves, releasing lead into the water. Um, switching from free chlorine to chloramine for the control of disinfection byproducts can result in lead release. And this is actually what happened during the DC water crisis in 2002. Um, and the presence of reductants, including dissolved organic carbon, can further enhance this dissolution. So all of this is to say that lead, lead scale chemistry is quite complicated, and it is further influenced by stagnation time and flow velocity. Um, and each water system has its own unique need needs and challenges. Um, here you can see what healthy lead scale looks like. It's a smooth, white, whitish layer generally. Um, and in this next picture, you can see that what corroded, uh, what corroded pipes from Flint ended up looking like at, at the end of the crisis. Um, so just for illustrative purposes. Um, so I wanna give a bit of a primer on the chemistry, the specific chemistry of the Flint water crisis. So Flint made the switch from getting its water from the Flint River back in April of 2014, which was a money-saving exer exercise. Um, the issue here is that the water from the Flint River is quite corrosive. It contains relatively high levels of dissolved chloride ions, about eight times more than the Detroit water, which can cause metals such as iron and lead to leach into the water. Uh, the high chloride levels in Flint were largely due to road salt, which runs directly into the river. Um, this problem was exacerbated lo not long after the switch to the Flint water supply um, because in the August following the switch, E. coli was found in the water. And to combat this, extra chlorine was added to, as a disinfectant to remove it. Um, however, this higher level of chlorine generated unsafe levels of trihalomethanes. Um, up here in the left, you can see that. Um, these compounds are byproducts of the chlorine reacting with organic matter in the water. Um, and these are actually carcinogens. Um, so to combat this problem, ferric chloride was added. You know, normally ferric chloride acts as a coagulant, allowing for the removal of organic matter from the water. However, this also helps to increase the chloride concentration still further, uh, making, which made the water even more corrosive and further causing the concentration of lead in the water to increase. The corrosiveness of the Detroit, Detroit water can, compare, can be compared to that of the Flint River using the chloride to sulfate mass ratio up here in the top right. Um, for the Detroit water before the switch, this had a value of about 0.45, indicating low corrosion. But after the switch to the Flint River water, this increased to 1.6, which is very high corrosion. Um, and you might be asking, well, why isn't this as much a problem in other cities where lead pipes are used? thinking about Boston, for example. Now, this isn't usually an issue because in areas where lead pipes are present, corrosion inhibitors can be used to prevent lead from getting into the water. And a common corrosion inhibitor is orthophosphate. Um, this is simply uh, phosphoric acid or salts of phosphoric acid. And you can see a cartoon of this here. Um, if you click one, it actually looks a little bit more like this in the water. Um, Orthophosphates, um, as I mentioned, lead phosphates are the least soluble and thus are the safest parts of pipe scale. So orthophosphates form low solubility complexes with the lead in pipes, forming that layer inside the pipe and preventing the lead from getting into the water. And these compounds were used in the Detroit water supply before the switch, even though that water had comparatively low corrosiveness. Um, next slide. Um, in Flint, orthophosphates weren't used at all, nor were any other corrosion inhibitors. And this meant that there was nothing preventing the lead getting into the water supply. It also led to the unpleasant discoloration present in the Flint water coming out of the residents' taps, as the iron in the pipes was also corroded by the water. And this is what creates that color change that you can see here. Um, when, the Flint, when Flint switched to the Flint River as a water source, the practice of adding orthophosphate inhibitors was discontinued, and phosphate corrosion scales began deteriorating, as you can see in the B figure here. Um, 
Now, since the LCR monitoring pool, the lead and copper rule monitoring pool in Flint did not have the 50% plus homes with lead service lines that is required by the law and other sampling methods, which were known to reduce the detection of lead and water used, the officials were able to claim that the city was in compliance with the lead and copper rule throughout 2014 and 2015, even though it wasn't. Uh, next slide. So in April of 2014, uh, the governor appointed emergency manager decided to temporarily switch to the Flint River for city water needs while the KWA pipeline was being built. Um, but it's, and while it's true that city officials voted in 2013 to switch to the new water supply when it was supposed to be completed in 2016, um, it's more relevant that the documented evidence says that the decision to use Flint River water in the interim was made by the state appointed emergency managers, not the democratically elected city officials. So Flint really wasn't able to have a full voice in this process. Um, in May of 2014, um, there was the first complaints of bad smell, taste, and odor, and the first boil alert was issued um, and a, a lot, uh, with uh, the E. coli that was found in the water, and chlorine was added to kill the bacteria. And in June of 2014, actually, the first case of Legionnaire's disease was reported. Um, now, in October of 2014, General Motors stopped using the water due to its corrosive nature. Um, they said it was corrosive to engine parts, and this should have been a real red flag. Um, and they used a waiver to go back to the Lake Huron water, but they just, uh, so residents were getting this incredibly corrosive water that wasn't even safe for engines. Um, but in uh, January 2015, oh, sorry, <laughs> excessive chlorine uh, continued to irritate people's skin and eyes. And in also in October of 2014, Flint officials notified the residents that their water was in violation of the Safe Water Drinking Act due to the excess levels of total trihalomethanes, those carcinogenic compounds that I just mentioned. Um, and this is an issue that the officials reportedly learned about months before. Um, and in January of 2015, uh, Flint hosted its first city hall meeting to address the water safety. Um, and the residents themselves, if you'll click, um, even lugged their own discolored tap water from the home to show the city and state officials to insist that the water was causing rashes and sickening people and pets. Um, but the officials maintained that the water was safe. And on top of that, Flint, the Flint State Office actually started using water coolers to avoid take, taking the, dra the drinking the tap water, even as the Flint residents continued to receive this water. And in March of 2015, uh, a citizen of Flint, Leanne Walters, reported a high level of lead, uh, measured it at 400 parts per billion, well above the 15 part per billion action level, even though her pipes were PVC. And the government actually arranged for a garden hose from a neighbor's house to get her water. Um, and the government continued to announce that the Flint water met all standards, even though it did not. Um, in March of 2015, children at home were found to have a, found to have a blood love level above 6.5 ppb, above the, what is considered safe, the 5 ppb level. And members of Flint City Council voted seven to one to reconnect Flint to the Detroit water system. But one day later, Jerry Ambrose, the city's emergency manager, overruled that vote and called it incomprehensible. Now, in April of 2015, Walters uh, was unconvinced and contacted the EPA. And the EPA, uh, Miguel del Toro, um, is specifically issued an interim report uh, with the subject high lead level in Flint water. Um, and this report stated that a service line was leaching excessive lead and that Flint wasn't using corrosion control measures. However, the EPA stalled, reprimand, reprimanded del Toro for overstepping his responsibilities and referred him to the agency's ethics office. So even though he was trying to do the right thing, the EPA went directly against him. But Del Toro pers uh, persisted and gave Leanne Walters his findings. And Walters passed those findings along to the media. And the American Civil Liberties Union of Michigan broke the story. And this is when it all started becoming quite public in the media. And in September of 2015, after residents organized a sampling effort, Virginia Tech researchers analyzed 252 water samples and reported that nearly 17% of samples measured above 
this 15 ppb allowed limit. Um, so in, 20, in September of 2015, spearheaded by Flint pediatrician Mona Hanna Atisha, uh, a study of more than 1,700 blood samples from Flint children found that the incidence of elevated blood lead levels in the city's kids had nearly doubled, with the incidence levels in certain zip codes nearly tripling. Um, and the city of Flint issued another final lead award, issues its first lead advisory since the switch to the Flint River water, finally acknowledging that it is a problem. In October of 2015, um, NSF 53 certified lead clearing filters were distributed to the public. Um, with an emphasis on pregnant moms, formula fed babies, and zip codes with the most toxic water. So it's finally this, there's acknowledgement that there is lead. Uh, next. Um, and in October, on to October 8th, Governor Snyder announced that the water would be switched back to Detroit. Uh, October 2015, this is when the flood of media attention really gained a lot of traction. Uh, Governor Snyder declared an emergency in Flint and the National Guard was uh, deployed to distribute bottled water and filters to the residents of Flint. In November of 2015, the newly elected Flint mayor, Karen Weaver, declared a state of emergency in response to the elevated lead levels in the city's water. And in January 2016, finally, a federal emergency in Flint was declared. Um, and in mid-2016, the first flood of lawsuits really began coming out. Uh, thanks, Kelly. So, so far, what we have understood is that uh, if you look at the overall timeline, it seems like it was just the government who was not acting responsibly in the case of Flint. But if you think about the holistic uh, understanding of the whole case, and if we go into the deep depth of what has happened around Flint over the time, we actually understand there were reasons why all this happened. So let's go into some of the important points. So first, we'll analyze the history of Flint and Flint River. Uh, which were responsible for generation of this kind of uh, conditions around Flint. We went in, uh, then we'll go into the government uh, uh, who was not properly representing the people, which also resulted in such a behavior by the government. The Flint city's socioeconomic made them a weak voice to be heard. And that was the reason government was acting this way. And similarly, government failed to comply with the existing rules, which themselves were pretty weak. Uh, then we go into the next point. We'll go into details of all of these points. There were inherent biases at multiple levels. And towards the end, the law, uh, the lead and copper rule, which is responsible for controlling lead in water itself was pretty weak. So let's go into details of each one of them uh, one by one. So when we talk about the history of uh, Flint, uh, people aptly say it's a struggling, deindustrialized urban center. And the reason is in 1800, the city was blooming. So basically, it was the center of fur trading and lumber. In 1980, during carriage factory was formed there. In 1908, GM's Buick factory was formed there, which was the largest factory in the world at one point of time. In 1900, the Flint was called the vehicle city of the uh, USA. And uh, the, the companies like GM, Chevy, Fisher had their um, uh, uh, manufacturing plants in the city of Flint. And just to give an example, during World War, Willow plant at Flint was making more bombers in a month than total made by Japan in a year. So you can understand the level of industrialization in this region. But if you go to 1970s, the companies started moving out and the city started downsizing. So for example, from 1970 to 2020, the currently, the city of uh, Flint has lost half of its population. Current, it, it has went from 200K to 100K over the last 40 years. And all this interesting history has resulted in certain features of the city. First, the Flint water, uh, Flint River um, has accepted or had, has, has been a dumping site for toxic industrial waste for decades, which has resulted in large quantity of bacteria in the water. The water is so bad, uh, it's thick and flammable that it has said to have caught fire in 1930s and 1950s. Things have improved after uh, that because of the new water acts, but still it, it has had that history. Similarly, if you talk about the water supply system, majority of service lines are lead service lines. They have large amount of lead because all the rules related to uh, banning lead came around 1990s and uh, something, whereas the most of the population was already there in 1970s. So most of the infrastructure of the city belongs to up to 1970s. And because of deindustrialization, uh, the 
system still remains there, but the requirements of water in the system has reduced. So there's more retention time of the water in the water system, which should uh, lead to more leaching of lead in the water. Similarly, just to give an example, in 2014, 20 to 40 percent of water piping system was leaking in Flint, and the Flint city's water bill was highest in the country. So you can see that the source of water, the Flint River, as well as the system which was providing water in the Flint, was both broken down, and all of these aspects were not considered in the decision making process. Similarly, when we talk about people's representation in the local government, as Kelly mentioned, in 2011, the government appointed uh, government basically declared financial emergency in the city of Flint. And the control of the city went from a mayor, which is a people selected person, to an emergency manager, which is appointed by, by the state. So the accountability of the person heading the city went from public to the governor. So the, the, all the decisions which were taken later on were also uh, more geared towards the interest of the state than the interest of the city. So just to give another example how bad things were, in uh, 2012, Public Act uh, 4 of 2011 was passed which allowed government to take over the municipalities. But this was done even though it was shut down by the uh, Michigan vote referendum. So that's how the bad conditions were. And the effects were uh, in 2013, around 50% of African-Americans and 2% of whites in the Michigans were living under the emergency managers. So they were not getting represented by the people they want them to be represented. And we see effects, for example, in 2014, as Kelly mentioned, six months after the switch, city council said, we want to return to the Detroit water, but the emergency manager said, this is a very incomprehensible decision and this is too expensive, we are not going to do that. So when we talk about the socioeconomics of the fleet, now that also played a very important role, uh, role here. So in order to understand that, just to give an idea of what people think about Flint, uh, what do you think is the percentage of people living under poverty in USA and the Flint in 2018? What do you think are the approximate numbers uh, in 2018? You have 15 seconds to respond. Uh, you can, I don't know. Yeah, I can give the results. So everyone voted. So 43% voted for answer number C. And then uh, B and D are pretty close at 29 and 21%. And A has 7%. So that, that's pretty good because the actual answer is D. So you said 9% in US and it's 12%. That's close enough. And Flint, it's 40%. So when we talk about Flint, it's the poorest city of its size in the country as, as of uh, 2018. Uh, the poverty in the national average is like, the poverty in Flint is four times higher than the national average. The life expectancy in the Flint is 15 years less than the neighboring suburbs. And in fact, the city is so broken down that the many Navy and special operations are done in the city of Flint because it's, it's a best analogous to a war on uh, corner of the world. And that's how the Flint city is. But why is it so? So we again go back to the history uh, and we realize that um, if you think about the city of Flint, it was the auto industry, as we mentioned, somewhere uh, around 1930s and 60s. And there was a large migration of workers or labor class in that city. And most of them were African-Americans. And in the initial years, when people were migrating, there were unjust hiring practices. There was an open like racism in hiring practices, housing and all. For example, in the right hand side, you can see the people clearly say that we are not going to take non-white uh, people in our community. So this was the status in the initial years. Now, later on in 1935, 1936, the United uh, Auto Workers uh, Organization got its recognition and the, the racism was eliminated. But from 1940s to 1970s, things were good. But after that, again, uh, things went bad as we saw in the earlier slides. So you can see that because of this interesting history, the city itself is facing these kind of conditions, disinvestment, unemployment, racism, illiteracy, depopulation, violence. And this has made city a really weak socioeconomics because people cannot contribute to the parties in their party funds and all. So the, the, uh, uh, the political parties do not care much about them. And we see the evidence of this particular thing, this particular aspect later in our um, slide. So if you think about the next point, the government failed to comply with existing rules at every point of time is, is very obvious. Like in the beginning, they did not follow uh, corrosion control treatment. Later on, they did not uh, do proper uh, 
analysis of what fluorine addition will do uh, to the water. They did not, uh, they allowed GM to go back to the uh, Huron Lake, but they continued to use same cohesive water for the citizens. They ignored city council's vote to referendum to go back to the Detroit River. Uh, they also did not listen to Del Doral as Kelly mentioned. And in fact, there were institutional attempts to suppress the voice. As an example, there's a famous um, researcher, uh, Professor uh, Mark Edward from Virginia Tech, who clearly mentioned uh, in his uh, scientific studies that the uh, lead water, uh, the water uh, in Flint has high content of lead, but people were, he was made fun of in the local journal by saying that wherever he goes, he finds large amount of lead in the water. It must be that he's too interested in finding samples with high lead. So don't pay attention to him. Similarly, EPA in one of the uh, responses, internet conversations talking about, uh, should we give water filters for the Flint citizens? They said like, you know, I don't think that the Flint is a community we want to go out on a limb for. So they do not value that particular uh, uh, Flint community. And that was the reason all these mishaps happened. And there were inherent biases, which were, uh, which is a very common feature we see that uh, in the beginning, they were elevated uh, level uh, of um, lead in the blood of children. And they were ignored because people thought these lead chips are coming from the walls because the city is broken. The paint says contains a high amount of lead. That's where it's coming from and not from the water system. Similarly, the Flint lies in the center of Great Lakes region, which is the world's largest freshwater source. So people thought that, you know, the water must be fine. Uh, they ignored the history of Flint. Similarly, uh, when it comes to testing children, uh, as a historical reason, people usually assume that the fight against lead has already been won during 1990s and 2000s. So lead is not a big issue these days. And that's why you have cases like Flint. So, so far we talked about all these socioeconomic reasons, but as a science test, the, or as a normal citizen, the first question that comes to our mind is that we are living in a democracy. Why are not rules sufficient for it? And what were, what were the rules? Why didn't like the laws of the government to control water quality were sufficient to control this crisis? So we'll quickly go into the lead and copper rule of 1991 and what it says about. So basically, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Protection Agency has this rule called lead and copper rule of 1991, which is supposed to control lead and copper in the water. Uh, it requires regular testing and sample collection in the sites, including lead, and, um, uh, lead service lines and check if the um, corrosion control treatment is working properly. And when I say regular testing, it's the frequency varies from six months to three years based on the kind of system we are talking about. The sampling requires that at least 50% of the samples should be collected from um, the sites which have lead. Uh, similarly, there are constraints on the total number of samples that should be collected, at least the minimum number of samples that should be collected. Uh, the size of samples is one liter. And if uh, there are constraints, for example, the water should stand in a system for at least six hours uh, for uh, these samples, because nobody should take like the fresh water and say like, you know, water is lead free, because practically that's what happens. The houses use um, standing water in the systems. And then if there are conditions, like if you want to collect the sample at uh, a lead service line, but you are collecting it through the tap, then make sure that the sample, uh, the water in between is properly flushed out and all. Uh, in terms of action, it, the, the law requires that whenever the total number of reported samples, uh, the, whenever 10, more than 10% of reported samples exceed 15 ppb limit, only then the action should be taken. So out of 100 samples, if 90 samples, um, more than 90 samples have more than uh, have less than 10 ppb, no action is required. And accidents itself is not a violation. It requires public education and replacement of lead service lines. So it's basically if you are a person under whom this uh, violation happened, it's okay. You just have to do something about it. You are not pushing. You are not uh, taking any disciplinary action against. And the state has power to take decisions on corrosion control treatment, which can change over time. Now, from the first look, it looks like the law is good enough. What's the issue? So now we go into a little bit depth, what happened actually there. So old LCR couldn't control loopholes in um, the old LCR couldn't control the loopholes which um, the Flint officials uh, take advantage of to underrepresent the lead poisoning in the drinking water. So how is that? So basically what happened was the, the uh, officials which were supposed to collect the water samples, uh, which is Michigan's, sorry, Michigan Department of Environmental uh, Quality basically asked people to pre-stagnate the, uh, the pre do a pre stagnation thing, which is basically uh, you ask people to run water six hours before water collection at a very high speed. 
what that will do is that will flush out all the dirty stuff in the water, all the scales and everything. And then you collect water after six hours. So it's not violating the rules that after six hours, the law requires the water has to stand for six hours. But it makes sure that the amount of lead in the water will decrease because you uh, ran the water at high speed. Similarly, if you're using any kind of aerator, cleaning and all, that should be removed because often that uh, contains the chips of lead in themselves. Uh, then they ask people to use smaller mouth water bottles, which means that will enable that whenever there are chips in the water, they will be around the uh, circumference. So if you're using smaller bottles, the amount of lead chips that you'll get in water will also reduce. So these kind of uh, guidelines were not prohibited in LCR. So they decided to add them by themselves and underrepresent the lead in the water. Similarly, the testing homes, they were testing homes with lead service lines, uh, without, sorry, uh, without lead service lines, because the, uh, the law requires that at least 50% of the sample should be collected with, um, should be collected from the houses with lead service lines. They decided that rest 50% could not be from that area, so, so that the overall uh, average comes down. Similarly, they removed 50% of the samples uh, because the law requires that at least 50% uh, of total collected samples should be reported. So they removed all the samples with high concentration and they were able to underrepresent it. So if you talk about, uh, this is my last slide. So basically, if we uh, talk about the shortcomings of old, uh, old LCR, is was the action level limit itself is pretty arbitrary. As I told about, uh, I, to I talked about it, like uh, the law requires that if more than 10% of the samples exceed this limit, something should be done. But this 15 PPV limit itself is non-scientific. We had a conversation with someone uh, who was involved in this process uh, while doing this project. And we came to know that this was basically based on the convenience and economics of the people who were manufacturing these pipes in those days. And rather than a scientific study. Similarly, the violation requires uh, actions are very subjective and there's no accountability on the people who are supposed to control it. Similarly, the warning is called off as soon as the label below uh, go below the limit. For example, if today the uh, limit is uh, the average amount of lead in water is 14.1, uh, there is no violation. Tomorrow it's 16.1, there is violation. And again, it goes to 14.9, there is no violation. So it's like the actions are so subjective and they are uh, so um, easily cut off that it helps in, in underrepresentation or mis uh, inaction on the part of the government. Similarly, the active identification is not there. The law basically tries to control the damage. Only when the limit is crossed, something will be done. If Even if you see that uh, the lead in water is increasing, they don't ask to do anything. Similarly, there's no database. I cannot tomorrow go to the government and say, say like, tell me what is the lead level in my uh, water system. The guidelines in CCT also allow for large delays. So this picture graphic that you see here is basically representing that. So as per the old LCR, the testing frequency is six months. The time for recommendation by the system to the state after violation of any kind of um, lead level in the, uh, in the system says that we have six months to uh, suggest what you will do to control lead in the system. Then the state has six months to respond to that and gives 24 months to the systems to install those uh, kind of remedies to control lead in their systems. Uh, so if you think about this overall timeline, it takes around three to five months to control overall lead in the system, which, which basically uh, creates a lot of damage in the people's health by the time it is um, discovered. So before moving forward, the most fundamental question that might come to your mind is that you're talking about lead, lead, lead. How about we get rid of lead uh, pipes, which themselves are leaching the lead? Or what is the cost of this corrosion control treatment? Because that's what is something uh, causing uh, lead in the water. So Ipuliti has uh, our first poll, which is what do you think is the average cost of replacing a single lead service line? So remember this 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 basically a pipe which is connecting mid supply to the house, and it's usually like three to four meters in length. Uh, okay. That's pretty good. The number is correct, but Let's go to the next one. Although the, now it's pretty obvious <laughs> that the answer is. Um, I don't think that's its own poll. Go next. That's okay. Yeah, let's go to the next one. So basically, the answer is C. So it takes like two hundred dollars per day to um, uh, apply CCT in a system, and uh, replacing LSL takes around forty-seven hundred dollars. Uh, 
Yeah, and one of the reasons, so I'll take over from here. So one of the reasons that pipe replacement ended up being really important in Flint is that even though they switched the water back to the Detroit water supply, it takes years or on the orders of months and years to rebuild that damaged pipe scale. So the only way to really guarantee safe water for the Flint residents was to replace the pipes. So in February of 2016, the Michigan State Legislature, appro Legislature approved $20 million in funds, $27 million in funds to identify and replace lead service lines. Um, this group, the group that was tasked with executing this plan was the Flint Fast Action and Sustainability Program, Fast Start. And these were involved in March 2016, um, where researchers from Georgia Tech and University of Michigan, where they began developing a machine learning, a machine learning model to predict the location of the lead pipes. And in April 2016, the Michigan Attorney General, Bill Shute, uh, conducted an independent review and ended up filing criminal charges against the first of 15 government officials. Um, and in, on December 10th of 2016, the US Senate approved a bill allocating $100 million in funds to address the lead contamination in Flint's water system. In January of 2017, for the first time since 2015, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality found that the city's water had tested below the federal action level for lead from July to 20, December 2016. However, the, the city's residents remained suspicious of the water after being lied to over and over. And a report by the Mich Michigan Civil Rights Commission asserted that deeply embedded institutional, systemic, and historical racism played a fundamental role in the decision to supply the majority Black city of Flint with river water as a cost-saving measure. And this, I believe, is our last poll. Um, what do you all think the settlement total was for replacing the lead service lines in Flint? Still two people who haven't voted, but. Well, let's continue just in the interest of time. The correct answer was 97 million. Uh, yes, so next slide, please. Um, so in March of 2017, a federal judge approved that $97 million settlement for new water lines in Flint. And this agreement stipulated that within three years, the authorities must examine, had to have examined the service lines for at least 18,000 homes and replaced those made of lead and galvanized steel. In December of 2017, the international engineering firm ACOM signed its con a contract with Flint uh, with the aim to accelerate the pipe replacement program. Um, but this ended up being a problem as I'll describe in a moment. Uh, in April of 2018, Governor Snyder announced the end of the free water bottle program in Flint, despite continuing suspicion of the water, uh, claiming that the water quality had been restored. Um, and in June of 2018, uh, mayor, the mayor of Flint, Karen Weaver, halted the pro pro practice of hydro excavation, which is actually a very cost reducing measure that can quickly and easily identify lead pipes compared to full-on excavations where the pipe is completely dug out. Um, and the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality issued a statement that they didn't agree with this. And it's true that this slowed down the rate of pipe identification. And in November 18, after the ACOM takeover, they excavated about 10,000 properties with only a 15% hit rate um, because they made the decision to stop using that machine learning algorithm. In the first year before ACOM took over, they had used that algorithm and the hit rate was about 70%. Um, so this was a, a grave mismanagement of, of scientific resources effectively. Um, and the attorney general's office issued a letter that the city was in violation of the settlement and demanded a return of hydro excavations and stopping the unnecessary digging of copper pipes. And in December of 2018, the Flint City Council approves an additional 1.1 million for ACOM's contract, despite the opposition. In February of 2019, in an agreement filed by the parties of the 2017 settlement, the city of Flint finally committed to using the data-driven approach that machine learning algorithm to locate the remaining lead pipes delivering drinking water to residents' homes. 
and the lead pipe hip rate incre increased back to 60 to 70 percent for the excavation. So this was a good decision. Um, in April of 2020, Flint suspended its pipe replacement program due to the co COVID-19 pandemic, but this was resumed uh, in 2020 as the state started to uh, lift its restrictions. And in August of 2020, uh, Michigan reached a $600 million agreement to compensate Flint's residents for the state's role in failing to protect them from lead tainted water. Uh, for an issue that could have been managed for on the order of $100 to $500 a day. So this is a high cost for an easily manageable problem. And the city of Flint, Michigan and two other defendants have further joined the Flint water crisis settlement, bringing the total value of the settlement and the lead poisoning case to over $641 million. Now in Flint today, uh, many excavations have been performed. They're effectively, all the pipe replacements are effectively complete, which is great, but at what cost? And the citizens of Flint are still very suspicious after being lied to over and over. Um, so what are the implications here? Well, let's talk about the current status and policy. Um, the EPA proposed an updated form of the lead and copper rule uh, known as the LCRR, so the revised lead and copper rule, which was re released in January 2021, so this year. Um, and the malpractices which allowed for the underrepresentation of lead levels um, have largely been banned or removed from the rule. And an additional trigger level of 10 parts per billion has been added and the law now requires the fifth liter sample to be sampled instead of the first liter coming out of taps. Um, but on January 25th of 2021, the Biden administration passed an executive order freezing the proposal to allow time for further review. And this was followed by an announcement from the EPA on March 10th that they would extend the effective date of the LCRR to request additional input from the public. And the EPA is in the process of collecting public feedback on the proposed changes. And as Shashank mentioned, both of us will be speaking to the EPA in a couple of weeks regarding this. But realistically, what does all of this mean? So while the EPA has recently invited comments for the, from the public for the new LCRR, decades of policymaking in the US have shown that while inviting public opinion is a quintessential part of policymaking in the US, this step rarely results in effective changes. And a study from Princeton researchers based on 20 years of data concluded that public comments have a near zero impact on policymaking in the US. Um, so we are concerned that the, they are merely inviting comments which might not result in, any, in many essential yet very easy to implement changes to the LCRR. Um, and of course, none of the revisions to the LCRR mean anything without accurate reporting and implementation of the law. Um, in the aftermath of the DC crisis in 2002, a 2003 inquiry found that the EPA lacked recent test results for nearly a third of the US's largest water systems and lacked information about regulation adherence for more than 70% of community water systems. And this problem, this failure continued to persist uh, the National Resources Defense Council in 2015 uh, did a review that found that only 3% of total violations of the existing LCR were reported, and a mere 10% of those reported resulted in enforcement actions, um, and this affected over 18 million Americans. Um, thus, while improvements to the lead and copper rule are the first step towards good water safety, the EPA needs to improve its enforcement to ensure that drinking water is safe for everyone. And we hope that the changes to the LCRR will actually protect people in the future. Um, and with that, uh, oh, yes. Um, and just finally to wrap up with some current events, since this is very recent, you might've heard of it. Uh, the Biden administration released the details of the American Jobs Plan on March 31st and aims to replace 100% of lead pipes in the US. Um, reducing lead exposure in 400,000 schools and child care centers and six to 10 million homes and to create union and, we, and prevailing wage jobs, according to the administration. And to fund the plan, Biden said he would ask con uh, Congress for 45 billion in the EPA's drinking water state revolving fund and water structure improvements for the nation grants. Um, however, it remains to be seen whether or not this will actually be passed but certainly based on the history, the safest way to protect people in the US is 
to replace all of these pipes. So we hope that the changes to the LCRR will protect people and that more and more pipes will be replaced with time.